All right, hi all, this is Andy, and I'm gonna be giving a lecture on topicality or framework um, that we read against affirmative teams that are untraditional in their approach to the topic and that they don't defend a fiat topical plan. Um, so let's start with kind of like what the purpose about uh, of debate or topicality is. Um, and the purpose of topicality is really to have a debate about debate. Um, and it's a debate about what version or model of debate best maximizes the benefits of debate um, and accesses the benefits, the possible benefits of debate in the best way. It's important to note that topicality does not need to solve the AF. Um, it just needs to set up a model of debate that best maximizes the benefits of it. So next, uh, we, we're need to, we kind of need to talk about the resolution, which is the mechanism by which um, debate occurs, or, or at least the negative will say so. Um, the resolution is the stasis point of debate, and what that means is that debate should be centered around the resolution because uh, it is the one central kind of predictable point at which both teams have equal access to, and it, it, the resolution is what divides affirmative and negative ground. Um, it's not just about kind of talking about uh, the nukes, for the nukes topic, for example, it's not just about talking about nuclear weapons, for example, um, or arms sales in the context of the policy topic, for example, it's about uh, the rest of it, which is the U, which is the which is states re eliminating their nuclear arsenals, or the entire resolution as a whole, which divides affirmative and negative ground based on the mechanism and the surrounding literature. Um, so, when constructing a one and C, you don't need to define every word in the resolution, uh, but you should kind of set up what it means to have a resolutional mechanism as and why that is important as a desirable stasis point. Um, so, why is it desirable to have a resolution as a um, steady stasis point that both sides have equal access to. First is that we all have the we all have the same resolution. It was announced in advance. Um, and second is that it defines the division of affirmative and negative ground, which is what I mentioned above. Um, and so basically the, what the resolution says is that both teams, the affirmative and negative, should know which side is going to say eliminating nukes good and eliminating nukes bad when they walk into the debate. So that brings me to predictability, um, which is an important concept to frame all of your offense. So uh, post hoc um, or after the fact predictability is a bad standard for debate, is the argument that you should be making because it uh, sort of promotes a horrible slippery slope where disclosure and the wiki justify literally anything. Um, arbitrary metrics are bad and self-defeating because they provide no kind of ability to set a norm or set a standard that is necessary for debate to occur. Um, files will come and go and arguments and debate will come and go, but we will always have the resolution as the starting point for debate. So just because like Afro-pessimism or capitalism, for example, are prevalent, are prevalent and pervasive arguments in debate does not mean that they are predictable um, stases for a year's worth of debates. Um, next is that predictability is a standard embedded in every framework argument, which is why I prefaced this by saying that this is an incredibly important concept to understand. Um, when you make arguments in the 2 and R, and when they make arguments as to how they can access the educational benefits of your model, you need to tie your impacts in the 2 and R and your impact framing to the internal link of predictability. Defending the value of predictability as it relates to the resolution is essential to win topicality, especially when it comes to arguments such as fairness and limits. Um, so uh, next I'll go into some of the impacts that are kind of that I have traditionally gone for and Maybe some other um, debaters can give some insight after this lecture as to um, sort of more hard portable skills, topic education kind of arguments. Uh, I've traditionally just gone for kind of like fairness limits and clash arguments, which are um, is, which is what I'm sort of more familiar with. But we need to start with the concept of like debate as a game. Um, and if you're if you haven't gone for topicality or been in any of these debates before. Uh, the idea that debate is a game, a quote-unquote game, seems um, kind of, to me, it seems sort of unintuitive at first and sort of silly to uh, call debate a game. But if you really break it down and um, think about the structure of debate, it truly is a competitive game. And although there are um, tons of benefits to debate and sort of it can be far more than a game, at its core, it is a game in the same sense that basketball is, um, kind of affords you the benefits of getting stronger um, and the, the kind of the team at the team nature of it, the competitive team uh, team nature of basketball itself 
can make it seem like more than a game and the benefits that you garner from it are significant. However, at its core, basketball is a game and it's silly if there are no rules attached to um, basketball, like if people are just able to travel or uh, violate shot, uh, shot timers, etc. So here's a kind of list of what makes debate a game that you can point out in your debates and cross-ex when they ask you why debate is a game or how you can point out why um, as to why debate is possibly a game. So um, first of all, I'll preface this list by saying that debate is definitely a game. If we look at the structure of debate, it is uh, kind of undeniable that there are some rules that um, structure debate such that it is a game. First is that obviously there's a winner and a loser, um, and debate becomes kind of silly if nobody wins and nobody or nobody loses, um, because then kind of all the competitive desire and all of our subjective reasons for doing debate in the first place become irrelevant. Uh, second is that the judge um, arbitrates the debate and decides who wins. Third is that there are time limits. Fourth is that cross-ex periods, there are cross-ex periods that have timed limits. There's also prep time. There's pre-round prep. Uh, it's a competitive forum. Um, there's pairings and power matching based on your individual record. Elimination rounds and brackets themselves are structured in such a way that it is akin to kind of like uh, other games that have brackets trophies and speaker awards, um, rules against things like clipping, uh, you do drills and go to camp, you spend tons of your time, uh, all for the competitive nature and because all of us want to win, results are recorded online and the structure of debate is so uh, that both teams get an advantage. Um, for example, the AF speaks first and last gets to choose the topic of the debate and the NAG gets the block in order to make up for that in policy debate. And in the case of LD, there uh, are time constraints on the there are time constraints on the affirmative. Um, next is that you kind of want to think about like if it is it if it isn't a game, then why do they want to win so badly? And um, the idea that we should channel the competitive incentives that debate as a game has structured uh, into the most productive means is is an important thing. Um, next is like KF's approach the game. Um, from a, di a couple different angles, and these are important to keep in mind. First is that they could just deny that debate is a game and that rather it's like an intellectual strategy uh, or activism. But you should respond that with those factors prove, um, even if those factors are true, debate is still fundamentally a game and they do not disprove the fact that the only thing that happens after the round is one team wins uh, and Tavroom says one team won and one team lost. Um, they might say that it is, but it's more than a game. Uh, and I think this is perhaps a more persuasive answer and more persuasive to um, more judges. They'll say that it's a game, but um, it's where we generate subjectivity, create community, etc. Um, you should respond to this with a procedural fairness, which is that we cannot violate fundamental aspects of the game without destroying the game to begin with. Um, and that's uh, that's true as well, because violating one norm or rule of debate uh, kind of allows us to break other rules. And for example, in basketball, you wouldn't allow someone to just travel um, and not let them break other rules because that's nonsensical and violates the fundamental structure of the game in the first place. Uh, and then second is that your impacts turn their offense um, because without the game functioning in the first place, debate is meaningless and nothing can be produced outside of it. Um, and if they do agree that debate is a game, that means they implicitly agree that fairness is a thing that matters. Um, yeah, so those are, I think, the two main approaches. They might also say debate is bad, uh, and you should have a robust defense as to why debate is good and has produced good things for um, specific groups and specific minorities or identities. Uh, and that's something that you can talk to your coach about before the round, or you can shoot me an email about it if you want to um, know a little more about that. Uh, and then finally is kind of like this rules versus norms distinction that a lot of teams uh, make. Um, things like no speech times, can't enter as MAV, etc. are obviously hard rules. But there are a couple things that you should keep in mind, which is first, if you agree that you follow rules, just not norms, you're not radical. Um, they're not subverting anything. And you should point out that's a massive double turn with whatever um, kind of radical offense that they are trying to make or whatever impact turn they're trying to make. They also follow literally every other norm. So it's impossible to say rules good, but norms bad without being a double turn because they also follow follow nor, uh, kind of like norms like speaking fast, sharing evidence, um, not clipping, which are all fundamental like norms of debate and not hard rules of the tournament. Um, finally is that rules are codified norms. 
you follow every other norm, like like line by line, cross X, um, et cetera. They follow all of those norms, but strategically don't follow the one norm, which is vital to neg prep and clash, which means that is a concession that fairness happens must come first and that their, that their following of those other rules is a double turn with whatever offense and proves that uh, pr proves that their offense is kind of non-unique or uh, other things in debate create exclusion or provide internal links to whatever offense they're going for. So that's kind of like a fairness articulation that you should explain, which is that like fairness in and of itself is um, an impact because it holds up the structure of debate, but is also an internal link to literally all the benefits of debate because debate would not be coherent without rules that structure it. So next is kind of like a limits and clash argument, which I feel like uh, should be in every uh, topicality or framework shell that um, you're including fairness in as well. So if we think about what the purpose of the resolution is, it is to create a limited stasis point by which both teams can access uh, in preparation and divides affirmative and negative ground equitably. And so the affirmative would allow anything tangentially related to the topic to be topical which means that the research burden for the negative just explodes. There are far too many critiques of the topic, such as nuclear weapons out there, and they justify any criticism of that uh, on the affirmative. Um, but there's only one kind of resolutional mechanism which sustains meaningful limits on the topic and equitably divides affirmative and negative ground, which is an important line that you should uh, state. I'm saying that a lot because it's an important kind of framing point for whatever their counterinterpretation is whatever their model of debate is, it does not divide affirmative and negative ground. It makes it, uh, it makes the negative's role inherently reactionary because the affirmative can choose whatever side they want or just choose whatever criticism from whatever perspective on the topic that they would like and forces the negative to be inherently reactionary. So uh, when impacting out limits and clash, you should say that limits are essential for robust dialogue and education. And the idea is that um, there are other academic activities that produce valuable academic research and um, allow for people to sort of think, of, to garner the skills to do research and think critically. However, the fact is that debate is, is an extremely unique academic activity in the fact that um, both sides have to contest each other and that there's a winner and a loser, which means that clash, preserving clash needs to come first in debate because it's the only unique benefit to debate. Education comes from clash, which is an important thing to understand. It's not just from the affirmative reading their speech. That's just a monologue or a speech. Like it does not, under limiting the topic is bad for dialogue and education. Something that the AF read or something that the AF said that is good is not a reason to vote for them because it doesn't produce a model which is tenable for the negative and provides the best source of education. Um, and then also, finally, I'll say like, uh, you should, that another true argument that um, I think uh, not a lot of teams are making, but you should point out, and perhaps it's, it, this might be like an impact turn to some of their arguments on the line by line, but you should say that um, it is better for small schools. Limits and predictability are essential to keep small schools um, in the game because big schools can basically, if, if we sort of jettisoned the topic and abandoned all topical constraints, big schools would be able to break monstrous hedge good, hedge good apps every debate with different mechanisms using the state and impact turn um, sort of negative critiques uh, with, di with their specific research and evidence um, and mechanism every debate, which would destroy the ability for uh, small schools to, compete, to compete. Um, you should point out that small schools now compete with topical constraints. Uh, Mona Vista, who uh, won the TOC two years ago, um, literally had no consistent coaching and were the only two were the only two debaters on their entire squad won the entire toc reading plans and disads on the negative um which means that there's only a risk of your offense uh okay so next i'll talk about kind of like affirmative counter interpretations so first you should point out if they're counter interpretation if they don't have one because it means that they have no frame for evaluating anything it also justifies literally anything and reading anything on the affirmative, um, which means they have no way to resolve their impact turns because nothing productive would come out of debate. Uh, if they do have, an, have a counter interpretation, does it actually, you should ask yourself the question, does it actually interpret the resolution? Uh, more broadly, n almost no counter interpretations read in these debates by the affirmative will interpret the topic 
or how we view the resolution, which is, which is problematic because an interpretation of the topic or model of debate needs to interpret the topic. Uh, for example, they might say um, your interpretation plus only our AF. First, again, it doesn't interpret the topic. It arbitrarily um, kind of imposes uh, a rule or an exception just for them. Dumb, which doesn't provide a sustainable model for debate. Second is that it's incredibly arbitrary and justifies everyone saying it. Um, it's never, quote unquote, just one AF, because using this one exception would justify any AF saying your interpretation plus ours, which ties into this idea of predictability, which is that their interpretation of debate must be predictable because it guides the way that we prepare in advance. Uh, third is that that produces a race to the margins and it has an effect on the competitive structure on debate. Topicality is only useful because when when teams lose on topicality, it creates a competitive incentive to read topical apps and fit within the limits of the topic. Um, if we create exceptions for people, it derails that kind of competitive structure, which is necessary to ensure that everybody reads topical plans. Uh, and of course, it's about models of debate, which is the, the last thing to keep in mind. Um, next, if they say direction of the resolution, you should say, first, they don't meet that. Uh, what direction is it in? For example, on the nukes topic, I debated an AF um, last weekend at the TOC against Greenhill, um, where they read an AF about Afro-Asian solidarity, um, and they read cards about why nukes have had produced bad, had produced um, sort of neg ne uh, negative effects and discourse on American, uh, on sort of Asian American populations in the U.S. Um, you should say, even if they have discussed kind of something that is tangentially related to the topic, the the quote unquote direction of the topic is the entire resolution. Using states as the actor is the direction of the resolution. That justifies any other kind of like uh, deviation from the quote unquote other directions of the topic. For example, people could say I'm in the direction of the topic because I use states as an actor, but had states cooperate on global warming, um, which creates a, st a terrible standard of debate and justifies other uh, deviations from the topic. Also, that, that's just a completely meaningless term. Like, what does the direction mean? The resolution itself implies burdens, not a direction itself. It implies who gets to debate what side of the resolution and divides affirmative and negative ground based on mechanism itself. And of course, through all these interpretations, you should be making quick arguments as to how uh, their counterinterpretations links to all of your offense. For example, uh, if they said our interp your interpretation plus our AF, you should say links to our li limits offense because it justifies everyone saying that, which means that there's functionally no limit on the topic at all. Um, is an example of something quick that you could, a quick links to links to limits argument that you can make. Uh, next, if they say it should be centered on social, social location or identity, or we should talk about our own identity in debate because it's predictable since we know our own identity. Um, first is that this explodes limits. Everyone has a totally different relationship or understanding of the topic. Um, for example, nukes, uh, every segment of the population, every individual, in fact, has a separate and different social location in relation to nuclear weapons. And it creates an app for every individual debater, which means that it is functionally unlimited because every debater can read something else. Um, it's also just not predictable and creates authenticity testing. And what authenticity testing means is that um, people have an incentive to kind of uh, fabricate or make their social location such that they read the most strategic arguments that fit best with the literature. And it's violent to kind of, uh, it's violent to sort of see, to kind of like test whether they're being authentic with their um, identity or conveying their ad identity in an authentic way. Um, it also just forces apps to disclose their identity and social location, which is a bad standard since no one should have to talk about themselves if they don't want to. Uh, last is that debating about individuals is problematic. Um, because it makes the sort of, it makes the ballot a referendum on uh, individual social location and forces the judge to render a decision based on um, an individual's identity or social location, which is inherently violent. Um, because it for, because when a judge does not vote for you, they're voting against your identity, um, and you should point that out to judges as an impact turn to their model. Uh, next, if they say only RF is topical, uh, this is similar to your inter plus RF. Uh, every debate, every debater would just say that that is a terrible form of debate. Even if it is more limiting, it turns all their education claims anyway. Um, and if they say, like for example, uh, with the race we're at, if they're like, this is predictable for X group, so it doesn't matter because it's like a relevant issue for them. 
you should point out the, the fact that it being a relevant issue for some subsection of the debate community does not make it predictable as a debate topic. There are hundreds of thousands of uh, individual political issues that are relevant or kind of quote unquote predictable in the sense that people know about it, but that does not make it a predictable debate topic or stasis. Next, if they say our interpretation is bad, causes fascism or colonial education, you should say that it's arbitrary because it requires you to define a word in the resolution to prove something that is topical. topical. That's unpredictable and in inherently anti-resolutional. And also you should respond to this with the rest of your kind of defensive arguments that I'll go over um, in my overview to answering uh, kind, of, kind of AF impact turns. Uh, if they make multiple counter interpretations, uh, the way that you should frame all of these interpretations is first, uh, it's about models of debate. None of them are topical, which magnifies our offense. I kind of talked about this a lot about a lot in depth above. Second is that second is that you should not let them kick out of them. It's framework versus the AF. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. So next, I'm going to be giving some like top level advice for how to how you should go about um, debating topicality and some like important uh, core kind of like defensive arguments that you should make to AF impact turns. So at the top, um, impact calculus in these debates is incredibly important. You need to think before your uh, your NR, you should reserve like 20 seconds of your prep time after the AR or the 1AR gave their speech. Just think about like what went wrong in that speech. Like uh, what have they done that, what strategic error have they made that I can capitalize upon? Um, what piece of offense did they undercover? And you should frame that through the into the way that you give your overview or the way that you do impact framing. Um, the most important thing that you need to think about, the two things that you need to think about when giving an impact when doing impact calculus on T is first, uh, what are the benefits to our model of debate? And second, how does the benefits of our model of debate interact with theirs? Um, and if you have those two things covered and make even if statements through that frame, uh, you'll be in a much better spot. And I guarantee that you'll start winning against these Fs. Okay, so some top level advice. I have like five or six things that I just wanna say at the top here. First is that the baseline thing that you wanna defend in these debates is that the AF should have a topical constraint for the purpose of maximizing research, depth, or clash over a topical proposal. Um, and that's kind of all the stuff that I went over above. Second is that when responding to a 2AC argument, you want to present a, an array of responses. Um, so the natural instinct, if you've um, had some of these topicality or framework debates in the past is going to be to make a reactive defensive argument that is kind of saying like, they say X, like they say we're policing them, but we're not policing them. Like, where did you get that from? That's totally nonsensical. And of course, like no link arguments are useful. And in some cases they are like uh, one of the better sources of uh, defense that you want to be, that you want to be making, but they also do need to be layered with arguments about why your model of debate achieves a, at a particular end better uh, why your goals, your model actualizes more important, actualizes things that are more important than their goals. Uh, why they don't have a particular, why they don't have a particular issue, uh, or why don't why they don't solve a particular issue. Um, and finally, like why the premise of their argument is incorrect or bad. And if you have these other elements that you kind of layer into your uh, layer into your defense to their impact turns, um, then you'll be in a much better spot. Uh, and of course, you can add an argument as to why their argument is not a unique offense against our interpretation or why they their interpretation of debate does not solve it or how their interpretation links to their own impact turn. Uh, and that's largely like very true for a lot of things. For example, like structural unfairness, for example, they might say like black debaters um, are demonized or are kind of like seen as aggr overly aggressive. Uh, there's no reason their interpretation solves that. Um, and if it does through just like fiat by having a uh, debater, a uh, judges just always vote for black people, uh, that magnifies, massively magnifies the link to all of your kind of fairness offense and just make, just breaks down uh, any coherent model of debate or competitive incentive. Uh, third is that you should only add complexity to your one and C arguments under the following conditions. One, you are ready to defend what you're saying. So you should not just add in a random topic, uh, topic education argument if you're unprepared to per, uh, defend the impact turn. Second is that you are ready to use the argument to interact favorably with your opponent's arguments. If you can't do both of those things uh, with an argument, then you're opening yourself up to risk with no, with no upside. 
Um, however, it is worse in clash debates because you will have created distractions and more elements of debate. And some judges view these debates uh, in a way where basically if one side is ahead on one or on uh, more parts, they just win, uh, which is kind of stupid. But uh, some judges have uh, very weird views on debate. So throwing just just throwing out like some random like uh, topic education offense, like debating about nukes good if you're unprepared to debate it or will debate it poorly can really hurt your chances of winning, even if nothing really happens in the grand scheme of things. Um, so yeah, fourth is that you have you have to have a sort of plan starting in the one and C about how you're going to interact or provide specific answers to the to the app's best offense. Um, so, for example, in my debate against uh, Zion Dixon, uh, going into the debate, we knew that the main push or their main offense would be would come from debate bad. So we spent all of our I spent all of my pre round prep um, with coach it with my with uh, a couple coaches just blocking that out, thinking about kind of meta level or like big like overview as to what I needed to win on that portion of the debate in order to best play defense to their quote unquote debate bad offense. Um, so that doesn't need to be a huge portion of the NR, but it does have to have like, you do have to have a part where you're just like, here's their main offense. Here's why it, it's like incoherent, why it links more to our offense. Um, all of the kind of defensive arguments that I provided above. Um, and what you should say should depend on context. You should try to be specific to their argument, obviously. Uh, topicality can really provide a lot of positive interactions with the 1AC but you should not plan on them being sufficient or you should not plan on your kind of like turns to their offense being sufficient. And you really do need to kind of identify which arguments they're making in the 1AR uh, and clearly line by line and answer them. And fifth is that you should focus on explaining things once and not repeating yourself. Uh, and that's something that's like, that comes with time and efficiency, but you should try to apply a particular argument in the NR where it clashes the most, makes the most sense on that spot in the debate fully explain it as to why it applies. Um, and then maybe if it applies to other things, you can quickly apply it on those things um, and just quickly maybe give a brief like one sentence explanation. But you should not have to apply it in like a million different places and you should not have to re-explain it in a million different places. Uh, in fact, that kind of creates a perception of lack of command and repetitiveness, which both wastes your time uh, and makes you, is not good for speaker points in the eyes of the judge. Uh, sixth is that you should focus on getting as many arguments on the checklist, which I'm going to provide below, into the debate by the end of the block as possible, uh, or the in, in the case of policy or in the NR as possible. Um, it creates a lot of pressure on the 1AR and 2AR if you have a big layer of interactive elements on framework coupled with some case arguments that interact with their theses and impact turns uh, on the framework debate. Um, because a lot of the arguments on the framework checklist that I'm going to go over are kind of like uh, independent things that are sweeping defense, um, and it's, it makes the debate extremely technical and hard for uh, the 2AR to cover completely. So um, if you haven't been taking notes up to this point, uh, honestly, it might be okay, but like for this next part, I highly recommend taking notes for this checklist. Um, so these are kind of like, this is kind of like a checklist of things that you want to try to get into the NR um, when you're debating topicality, and you should try to get as many of these as possible into the NR. So first, uh, on the checklist is internal links to offense. And there's many sub points to this. So you need to get, you really want to get um, get to the point of like why procedural constraints and stasis is necessary for, proce for procedural constraints. Second is that um, lack of constraints means that ex post and ad hoc changes to subject matter create structural advantages. And that's the thing that about predictability that I went over above. Third is that mechanism um, mechanism and kind of propositional content focus is key. Uh, and what I mean by that is that we should debate about, that, about the mechanism of the resolution because that's the most accessible form of debate. It provides the most accessible research, the, uh, the most direct refutation, uh, etc. It's And you should point out that it's not about goals, um, but it means that we are the most fruitful form of debate. And if the purpose of the activity is to lead real world change, then debating about mechanisms and getting to the third and fourth line testing that um, limited stasis that a limited stasis allows for is the best internal link to education. Fourth is that no topical requirements cause a race to academically marginalized, uh, marginal or totalizing arguments to ensure that you have something to say, which creates repetitive and unproductive debates. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, phrased in another way, kind of like not having 
uh, limits on the topic means that there is always a competitive incentive to run to the most irrefutable claim because uh, the way that competitive incentive work incentives work is that when an AF team loses to something, they have an incentive to uh, kind of revise out their contestable parts of the affirmative until their affirmative really boils down to just like standing up saying anti-blackness is bad and then sitting down, leaving the negative no role in the debate and leading to extremely unproductive debates where the negative has to, is forced to go for generics like Cap or Wilders in every debate, um, but are never improved to, are never kind of challenged or never challenged the affirmative to refine their arguments. And then fifth is that balanced competitive incentives are necessary. It is what drives research to the higher levels of clash instead of just surface level engagement. Sixth is opportunity cost. The AF, fo the AF focus is on what orients individuals um, and what orientations they should have towards macro political structures, uh, which does not trade off with hypothetical implementation of some policy. In fact, it flips the role of the AF and the NAG because they can win as long as they prove an assumption tied to the resolution is wrong, which puts the, bur which puts the burden of proof on the negative since the negative has to prove that the resolution is logically inconsistent. That locks in a massive affirmative side bias since they can cement their, infer their infinite preparation to force the negative into a reactionary and reductionist position. Seventh is that argumentative polarization will occur. Um, and what that means is that there will be an incentive to, moving, to move further to the left, uh, which is what I talked about above. All right, next is that you should answer, um, you should have answers to link defense. And there are multiple subpoints to this as well. First is that the AF doesn't generate the same levels of engagement and controversy as the negative. Um, facially controversial statements and obvious truisms is what they uh, the affirm is what the affirmative will kind of run to. The uh, AFs use debates norms in relation to things like competition to minimize clash. They choose the one kind of norm in debate which benefits them the most. Second is that all teams have an incentive to engage in minimizing available clash to opponents. That's why it's an agreed upon topical constraint before the tournament is before before the tournament even occurs. Um, and that standard is better to preserving roles for both teams instead of post ad hoc uh, changes during a tournament. Third is that the negative vision of debate is not stale. It provide it leads to a focus on depth and third and fourth level responses. That is a different kind of newness that in the details is driven um, by novelty, but is driven by the details and novelty of details rather than kind of just thinking about oh what's an argument that I could break that. They won't have answers to, which is not a kind of productive or detail focused vision of debate. Fourth is interesting one ACs are followed up by incredibly generics one NCs um, because of the research burden and competitive incentives, which is worse. And it doesn't challenge the affirmative to refine their position. Fifth is the kind of question of the optimal model. Not arguing people, you, you, you want to say that you're not arguing that people are going to quit, but the question is about maximizing debate's potential. Uh, next is the impacts. So first, uh, you want to say that better prepared opponents maximize debate's potential for the purpose of refining arguments. Second is that you want to make the argument that degrees of detachment from argument from an argument is an effective way to break down dogmatism and create self kind of this thing, this question of like self questioning, where debaters constantly rethink their position um, and come to the most informed conclusions. Third is this idea of truth testing, and what that is is essentially the affirmative, you should filter, you should say like, you should filter all of the affirmative's um, truth claims on the affirmative page uh, as fundamentally untrue or untested because they have not been subjected to a well-prepared opponent. Uh, so it is just as equal that we're losing them on the, we're losing these arguments on the case debate because as the fact that we weren't, uh, we weren't able to adequately prepare for them in the first place. Fourth is that comp competition and strategy shape all the decisions that affect fairness and education. So it has to come first in self in preventing in sort of preventing the uh, derailing debate or the derailing the important things that are central to debate, like research and depth that are necessary for education. And I'll add one kind of framing point in the middle of this, which is like a lot of the a lot of affirmatives will position themselves as a protest to the resolution, uh, or say that the resolution is somehow violent in some way. Um, but you should say that uh, in comparing your impacts to theirs, you should say like, if they have posited themselves as um, protesting the resolution, you should think about like, you should urge the judge to think about what the value of coming to a protest meeting is if you don't know the subject matter of that protest meeting in the first place. 
Um, it kind of evacuates all radical potential from that meeting if we don't know what we're going to be talking about in advance and we just end up talking about generic broad level ideas but don't get down to the details that are necessary to uh, have our protests succeed. Next is um, defensive arguments to impact turns and this section is extremely important um, because I don't think uh, any lecture in the world will have enough time to kind of go through every possible impact turn that the affirmative can make to topicality as to why imposing limits or constraints uh, on the affirmative team is bad. However, if you have this checklist and this toolbox of arguments that you can make on uh, their impact turns, then you'll be in a much better spot. So first is that debate is about argument testing and a process of refinement, not actual activism, which is a distinguish, which is a distinguishing issue that uh, obviates much of their offense. Second is that debate should be focused on the concerns of the world, not the micropolitical. Any strategy that can be executed in a single debate whose entire, uh, whose entire impact is kind of like circumscribed within debate uh, is a poor use of debate's intellectual and material energies. Um, and you can read cards to support this. I usually don't uh, read cards for this. I just kind of like assert that limits is, limits is a key internal link to that. Um, I know a lot of other debaters do like reading cards on these kind of issues. So um, feel free to do that if you feel like um, that's a productive use of your YNC time. Uh, three is that debate is a technique that doesn't commit to any particular position. It is uh, a bland, vanilla, um, and blanket structure that we use in order to uh, fill with detail and nuance, um, and that is only possible through limited, limited stasis. Fourth is that ballots only pass provisional adjustments uh, on relative debating and who did the better debating, not the validity of any particular uh, intellectual position. And that is extremely well, uh, well paired with um, a kind of fairness argument because it means that ballots don't um, are meaningless outside of saying who did the better debating, which proves its value as a game and its inherent nature as a game. Five is that ballots in influence competitive incentives that can influence things like research, but don't inform subjects or spill over to broader activism. Sixth is that exclusion and limits are inevitable. Uh, through things through a function of speech times, resource constraints, differences in coaching, differences in squad size, etc. Which means it's just a question of if they fall along lines that are the least self-serving and maximizes debate's argumentative potential and also proves that the fact that we do need procedural constraints on content in order to uh, level out the playing field and make sure that minorities do not get dominated by larger schools. Seven is that any turn they have is to a more particular practice that is not intrinsic to the idea of using procedural constraints to create uh, predictable research that allows for depth and maintains a meaningful role for the negative that is not obviated on the whim of an affirmative team. Eight is that debate's failure to live up to a more ideal version of fairness is not a reason to dismiss it out of hand. Um, and there's this, there's a kind of like famous Rudy card that you can read. Uh, and if you want the, if you want a copy of the card, you can look at Cal's doc, Cal FG's docs, or you can just shoot me an email um, that articulates this pretty well. But if you don't want to read the card, that's also completely fine. All of these arguments can be made without cards, in my opinion. Um, you should just say that uh, another defensive argument that you can pair this with, or that is more offensive, is that even if they win, that debate has failed and that debate is problematic in some sense. Um, you should still vote negative in order to, uh, to preserve procedural constraints that equal the playing field so that debate does not degenerate or become worse. Um, nine is that, your tur that, is that their turns to topicality are resolved by um, the argumentative circulating or the kind of like iterative process of debate in which saying it on the negative resolves it. Um, Basically, it makes us more informed, more informed about certain topics, causes self-questioning, which um, if their position is truly one that ought to be adopted, we would come to the conclusion of at the end of the, a year's worth of debate. Um, and them reading it on the negative as a criticism of topical reform would solve this argument. And you should frame it um, like a comparison. So th they have kind of already come to the conclusion by themselves that the position they've taken is true. Uh, and they have front-loaded that by violating procedural constraints. However, the negatives model of debate provides a far greater and far stronger internal link uh, to coming to that conclusion because it forces debaters over the process of a year to go through iterative testing, refine their arguments, do research and more detailed third and fourth line testing into the specificities of uh, reform versus kind of whatever their criticism is, 
And at the end of the year, debaters can still come to the conclusion that the resolution is messed up in some way. But the process of debating provides a far stronger internal link to that because it forces debaters to consider nuances and self-question. Uh, and then 10th is like this topical version thing um, that is kind of like the first thing that uh, novices are taught about topicality, which is that topical options exist. Um, and oftentimes there are parts of their card that advocate for topical ways to advocate change. Um, and if there are flaws in a topical version, that's a reason to vote negative because it demonstrates that there's a role for both sides and problems with the topical version are actually negative ground. Also, it, you shouldn't care um, if the app isn't to their liking or isn't like perfect for them um, because it means that they don't, it basically, that doesn't have any bearing on incentives for fairness or education. It just replicates the self, self the kind of self-serving behavior that um, topicality is critiquing in the first place. And then finally, you should say like all of the imperfections in the topical version are offense and we have impact turned all of their problem, their sort of problems with top, with the topical version because um, we've made arguments as to why imperfect uh, positions are and forcing you, forcing the affirmative team to grapple with imperfections in their position forces them to refine it and think through their positions, which makes which makes them more effective and better advocates in the real world. Um, it's also uh, just better. It's also just preserves a role for the negative, and it allows them to compare their affirmative to um, their specific instance of reform to something on the negative or a critique on the negative of liberal reformism, um, which allows them to implement or kind of incorporate uh, large elements of their criticism into a topical model of debate. Um, finally, is that the topical version, of course, does not need to solve the app in the same sense that a counterpoint needs to solve the app. It simply needs to provide in roots to the discussion that they wanna have and provide uh, an opportunity or a mechanism for them to research the research they want to research and um, participate in debate. Um, so that's kind of like most of it. Uh, I'll next go into some, I'll finally, like the last section is that I'm going to be going into some like potential identity arguments that they could make. Um, but there, there, in reality, there are like a ton of different arguments they can make. And if you use the frames that I've provided in the framework argument checklist, and once you kind of like understand what uh, how these debates go down, then it will make it easier for you to identify arguments and point out why they're flawed. Um, but I'll go through some identity arguments that perhaps are uh, less obvious based on less obvious as to how to answer based on the framework checklist above. So if they say we're trying to control we're trying to control language through topicality, um, or that we destroy black vernacular or whatever, first is that. Um, our argument is about proposition of content as it relates to the topic, not the form that it's communicated, which means the affirmative can kind of like demand action upon the state incorporating black vernacular or unique vernacular languages. Um, so in that sense, you can really agree with them to some degree uh, in that you can incorporate unique dialect into the topic. But you should say that um, kind of moving towards a unique or, or moving towards a common language is important and is an important ideal of debate because if we just kind of stood up and did not understand what, you, what each other were saying, that would destroy the intellectual potential of debate. Um, finally, is that there's no threshold for the kind of like intelligibility argument. If you understand it sufficiently to vote for it, you are rendering their speech as legible and collapsing it into kind of like pure information when you vote on it in the first place, which turns that offense. Um, if they say self-care and that you should vote for them for the purpose of self-care, uh, you should say that self-care is not incompatible with a political strategy, which is to say that um, basically either self-care is a process in which, it, uh, in which case it can be a praxis which is layered on top of other political engagement, um, or it links to our offense, which I've explained above, about how making debate about individuals is inherently violent because it forces debaters to debate each other's identity and forces judges to render a decision based on individual's identity and causes authenticity testing. Um, if they say like fair, any flavor of like fairness bad because um, things are already unfair for like black people, for example, and that we should just eschew fairness, um, the most important thing to point out is that they do not solve anything, any of that. 
they don't solve the fact that there are resource disparities in debate that disadvantage black students or that uh, anti-blackness and striking of black judges occurs in the debate community. Um, none of that is solved by jettisoning fa uh, procedural fairness as an ideal or as something that we should work towards because procedural fairness is the only thing that is keeping racist judges from just saying, I voted against you because I don't like black people or black scholarship, which means that um, keeping some level of baseline fairness, uh, which is prevalent in other for other uh, in other avenues of the debate, like the fact that there are speech times, the fact that uh, judges vote on the line by line and not their convictions, prove that um, it is important that debate needs to be fair and proceed at least procedurally fair in order to l flatten out structural um, inequities. Which means that our model best accesses that. And then you should also point out that. Uh, no, no structural fairness in the first place uh, breaks down debate. If essentially structural fairness, if we got rid of all structural unfairness, debate would just become a coin flipping activity where everybody went three three. Um, that would be structural unfairness because uh, things like different the the speed of debaters, inherent talent, the amount of research that has gone into debate has gone into each uh, each team's kind of position are all structural inequities that. Um, should be kind of preserved in order for debate to encourage competition, um, etc. Um, next, if they say that like debate has produced bad people or that debate has produced people, the example they always give is like Karl Rove. Um, you should say like just because debate as an activity has produced some like neoconservative thinkers does not make does not cast a final judgment on whether debate is neoconservative or whether debate is bad in the first place. Um, that's that is purely illogical. Uh, I'm sure there are bad, there are kind of like racist politicians or racist people that did student council in high school. Um, that does not cast a judgment on whether student council is racist or neoconservative. It just means that um, debate or student council produces people, produces skills that uh, can be applied in different ways in the world, which means that we should, we should kind of uh, place a premium on details and coming to the most moral conclusions through uh, ethically debating. And that is only possible through predictable stasis because only then can we kind of self-question and question our dogmatic beliefs. Um, also, you should point out that tons of good people have come out of debate, like Wexler, um, Neil Katyal, who defended Gitmo detainees and uh, led the impeachment trial for Donald Trump. Also, Carlos Maza debated at Wake Forest, um, and he runs Vox and has fundamentally progressive uh, ideas about politics. Um, yeah. Uh, and there's obviously a lot more. And if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to email me. 21 Andy L is my email. It's my school email. Um, yeah. And I'll go over one last thing, which is if you're in an ELIM round and you flip NAG knowing that they're going to flip it or read a KF, and they, they're like, you've like, this is racist. Why do you flip neg if you're just going to go for T? Um, there are a couple of ways that you can answer this. First is that you can just say, uh, we thought your negative arguments were better. Um, or I was tired of debating, of being AF. Just provide a different reason, um, which also proves that it's like non-falsifiable why you flip neg. Um, second is that uh, we thought, you should say that we thought that we could beat you. Uh, and in fact, debate is a game, which means that Topicality, in fact, is a strategy um, that can be employed in order to best model, in order to best provide a model for debate. And the fact that debate is a game proves that topicality is a strategic argument. And the fact that they read their app that is non topical, explicitly non topical, is also a strategic choice that they have made. Third is that we, uh, you should say, we think that our model of debate is good and that we'd like to forward it. Um, which means that their question, their kind of um, question relies on the assumption that T is not a response to the app. When in fact, topicality is just a critique of the affirmative. You should frame through all of this the idea that topicality is um, not something, not a violent response to the app, but rather just a disagreement with their choice to not open themselves up to criticism or not uh, kind of go, not kind of, it is a critique of their choice to not follow or abide by procedural constraints. Um, and you can just say, we thought, like, I'm better on the neg or the 2N is the better debate or whatever. Uh, and then one last framing argument that you, you can make on a lot of these impact turns is that they might try to cast topicality or the strategy of framework as um, a violent imposition. 
Uh, and the way that you should approach this is that you should say, um, topicality is not violent. Um, we've provided an interpretation that we think is the most, is the that sort of like maximizes the benefits of debate to the greatest degree. We made it open to negotiation. Um, and topicality, in fact, is a process of negotiation in which both sides negotiate, come to the negotiating table and talk and discuss which model of debate is the best. And if the judges believe that our model of debate uh, best maximizes the benefits of debate, then they should negotiate in favor of our model, which means that topicality is not like a race war or it does not promote a race war. It does not promote racism. It's not, um, does not position you against the, your opponent since you made it open to interpretation, but um, especially if they did not like make a counter interpretation or uh, even attempt to kind of like remodel or reshape what debate looked like and in fact said debate bad, that's not really offense that they can go for. Um, yeah, so that's like all that I'll talk about for now. Um, obviously there's like a million other things that uh, people could say on the negative that our response are um, or uh, sorry, that could they could say on the affirmative that our response to topicality and impact during topicality. If you use the checklist at the top, then that I gave in the middle of this lecture, then you'll be in a good spot. If you apply all those um, defensive arguments. Oh, uh, and and just like one last thing, uh, postmodern. It, there's like a there's like a whole different like set of post of arguments that postmodernism um, affirmatives make as impact turns to topicality. Um, and I might do, I could do that in a separate, uh, in a kind of like a separate um, lecture, but the main frame for those arguments is like one, uh, they've attempted to, so their broad argument will mostly be like, att like attempting to map out the world is violent because it creates like, it's the same logic that we used in drone strikes in the war on terror or like trying to control language is bad or like trying to like, uh, control like modes of communication is bad. You should say like, um, for all of these arguments, it always links to them. Okay. So this is the thing that I had talked about above where it's like, there's no threshold for their intelligibility arguments, which means that because they've still tried to communicate or do something productive in form in the form of communication to the judge, which proves they link just as much. And then you should be like defensively. You should be like topicality is not the same, uh, quote unquote, will to transparency that they criticize that produced neoconservative tactics in the war on terror, um, there's still some unpredictability in our model of debate. Uh, we're just saying that when the affirmative team and negative team walks into the debate, they should have a general idea of who is going to say uh, eliminating nuclear weapons good and who is going to say uh, nuclear weapons bad or eliminating nuclear weapons bad. Not Which means there can still be some predictability in what the 2 and R goes for um, or what arguments the AF makes, but that generally division of ground is necessary for uh, debate to occur and for the benefits of debate to be actualized and use the frames that I talked about above. All right, so I've been talking for a while now, so um, that'll be all. Of course, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Um, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on this, um, so I'm happy to talk at any point.